Hey everyone, how's it going? So I know I'm not the first one to do this challenge, but I think I'm the first to do it in gold and silver. The idea is very simple. We're going to try and go through the entirety of the game without ever taking damage. Of course, there's going to be a lot of resetting, but that doesn't make the challenge any less difficult. In addition, we're not going to be using any items in battle, and as always, I'm going to try and do this at the lowest level that I possibly can, but otherwise, anything else we can use to our advantage, we are going to. And the first thing we should use to our advantage is picking the right starter, because it's very important. The starters in Gold and Silver are actually really, really good, and there was a bit of a debate which one I should pick. I initially tried Chikorita, but unfortunately, after wasting about six hours, I realized Chikorita wouldn't work. The reason behind my choosing it is that it learns Razor Leaf at a really low level, but long story short, didn't end up working out. So instead, I'm going to pick Cyndaquil, and there's two really good reasons to pick Cyndaquil. The first is that it evolves at a really low level, level 14, which is the lowest I think ever among a starter Pokemon. And number two is that it gives you some good matchups in the early game. However, the biggest obstacle right now is the first rival fight. One thing I really like about Gold and Silver is unlike Game Champ or Small Ants runs where the rival battle happens right away, in Gold and Silver, you first have to go to Mr. Pokemon's house, which gives you opportunity to train your Pokemon first. And it's for this reason that I picked Gold and Silver, because if you watch Small Ants video, you'll see that he reset around 60 times before he got a rival battle that actually worked. In my case, I just had to level up to level 14, and it's really not that bad, because in Gold and Silver, at a 15% rate, there are Kakuna or Metapod, depending on your version. I picked Silver because I like the more active pose of the sprite. It's also really cool that the sprites are different in those two games. But regardless, you can knock out enough of them to level up to level 14, become a Quilava, and with the critical hit, it's a one-hit KO. Now, this was my first attempt, but I was planning on resetting until I got the critical hit. It's a 1 in 16 chance, so not bad. I could also have leveled up a little bit more to try and 1 in KO without the critical hit. I had options, but pretty grateful that the rival fight happened so quickly. And now we can continue on to the rest of the game. And here I need to start planning ahead. Because while Quilava is really good, it's not going to be able to take on the entirety of Johto by itself. So there are a couple Pokemon that I thought would help me out immensely. First Pokemon is Bellsprout, which is available on Route 31, just outside of Violet City. We're not gonna be using Bellsprout in the near future, but it is a super important Pokemon, so I'm gonna level it up a little bit in Dark Cave. There are lots of Geodude there. For now though, Quilava will just make easy work of all the Bellsprout in Sprout Tower, and then we can take on Faulkner, who is also not too bad whatsoever. At level 18 with my stats, and I believe this Quilava actually had perfect special DVs, which is insanely lucky, a 1 in 16 chance. I wasn't able to knock out the Pidgeotto, although I came really close. At level 19, it was what we call a range, and let's talk about this right now because it's going to come up again and again. In Pokemon, moves don't always do the exact same amount of damage every single time. This is pretty common in RPGs. Sometimes moves will do a little bit more, and sometimes they'll do a little bit less. In our case, we almost always want them to be a one-hit KO, and when it can be a 1 to KO but not guaranteed, you'll hear me refer to that as a range from now on. Pidgeotto was a range, but it was a moot point since I got a critical hit, and that works well for me because leveling up at this point takes a really long time considering how high a level I am. But that's one gym badge in the book, and no real major trouble spots. Now we're going to move on to Union Cave, and here is where Bellsprout will start to come in handy. There are some hikers here with Geodudes, and one with an Onyx. For the ones with Geodude, Bellsprout's Vine Whip makes quick work of them. With the Onyx, you're going to have to try and move past him, because Onyx is speedier than Bellsprout. Until you evolve to Weepin' Bell, you're not going to really outspeed anything but the slowest of Pokemon with Bellsprout. And that is the end goal, so we're going to try and fight as many Geodudes as possible. However, there's another obstacle that comes into play that we need to keep in mind, and that's Quick Attack users. Pokemon like Rattata, Raticate, and Vulpix all can learn Quick Attack, and you need to be very aware. Thankfully, Quilava also learns Quick Attack, something I forgot and another great reason to pick it. And it's a one-hit KO, albeit a range, so I can use Quick Attack before it potentially does and knock it out without having to worry. Not too bad. 
We then can move on to Azalea Town itself, and after defeating the Rockets, we can move on to Bugsy. Now the strategy is exactly what you'd expect. We're going to use Ember with Quilava. Unfortunately, we don't learn Flame Wheel to level 31, and leveling up that high would take a very long time, and it isn't necessary, as you're going to see. What we are going to do to help out is you can buy a Charcoal in the Azalea Pokemart. Yes, you get a free one later on, but unfortunately, we need this Charcoal now, and you don't get the free one until after you've defeated Bugsy, so that really just doesn't work. But at level 25 with the charcoal, we're able to use three embers and knock out the Metapod, Kakuna, and the Scyther. If it decides not to use Quick Attack, it won't always use it. In fact, it rarely does, but something to keep in mind. And that pretty much does it for Quilava. I know, plot twist, but this run is all about what's going to help me right now. And right now, Quilava isn't going to be all that useful because... We have Rival Fight number 2. He's going to be using a Ghastly, a Zubat, and a Crocona. Quilava is simply not going to do nearly enough damage against the Crocona, not going to be close to a one-hit KO, and Crocona is going to attack. So, we're going to need a bit of a better strategy. Enter Weepin Bell. It doesn't seem like it'd be that great on the surface. Vine Whip is double resisted by Zubat, and it's resisted by Ghastly, but it knows Sleep Powder and Growth. So we can put Ghastly to sleep, which doesn't like to attack anyway, build up our growths, and then potentially sweep through Rival 2's team. At least that was what I was hoping. Obviously, I had to level up quite a bit using the Geodudes and Onyx in Union Cave to get Weepin' Bell to this level. But once it was at level 21, I was able to put the Ghastly to sleep on the first turn, use two growths, and one hit KO the Ghastly. The Zubat, I was also able to put to sleep the first turn, but since it's double resisted by Zubat, I decided to use another growth, and still it was only doing about one third of Zubat's health. Unlike in Gen 1, Pokemon can attack the turn they wake up. Thankfully, Zubat goes for Super Sonic, it misses, and I'm able to knock it out with that third Vine Whip. Croconaw, uh, I outspeed, and it's an easy one hit KO. And this was a battle that actually took me a really long time to figure out, since originally I was trying with Quilava, but Weepin' Bell ended up being really, really great, unexpectedly so, and is going to be our main for the foreseeable future. But after we get through Ilex Forest, there is a Pokemon that we're going to need to catch. A Pokemon that is so overpowered in Generation 2 that it became my mascot, Kadabra. And yes, there is no cute origin story here. Kadabra became my favorite Pokemon because as a little kid, I couldn't believe just how great Kadabra was at getting through the game, especially because it learns all three elemental punches available in the Goldenrod Pokemart. And very soon, Kadabra will be a very useful Pokemon, but right now it's a little underleveled. And we're about to face what many consider to be the most difficult gym leader in Pokemon history. I think that's debatable, but Whitney does have a bit of a reputation of being difficult, and her mill tank is definitely pretty bulky. So we're going to need to level up a bit more. And in doing so, we're going to backtrack a bit, because remember how I said there are two Pokemon we can catch? I hadn't actually caught the second one yet, so let's go do that. That Pokemon is Ghastly. Now, I know that Ghastly seems like it would fill a similar niche to Abra slash Kadabra, but there are a few advantages and disadvantages of using a Ghastly slash Haunter. The biggest advantage is the fact that it isn't affected by priority moves like Quick Attack. Thankfully, unlike in Red and Blue, there aren't too many Pokemon that use Quick Attack, but there are enough of them that Ghastly will be immensely helpful, because let's face it, a Quilava or Typhlosion with Quick Attack isn't going to be one-hit KOing Pokemon forever. The second reason that Ghastly is good is that it has really good special and access to pretty useful moves. In Crystal version, which is harder at the beginning because of no Metapod or Kakuna, is a lot easier at the end because you can teach Ghastly Thunderbolt right away, as opposed to what I'm going to be doing, which is relying on Lick to level it up, which is very tedious and time-consuming, and then eventually giving it Shadow Ball once we defeat the fourth gym. We still got a ways to do that, but letting you know the roadmap here. For now though, we're going to be training all our Pokemon, and once Weepin Bell gets to level 31, it's ready to take down Whitney. Now, like a lot of the strategies in a damageless run, there's going to be some luck involved, but all you need to do 
is put Clefairy to sleep, set up three growth, so that's a bit of the luck component, but once you do that, it's a one hit KO on Clefairy and a one hit KO on Miltank. And what a great job Weeping Bill has done defeating two of the more difficult trainer fights in gold and silver runs. I know I haven't made videos on YouTube, but I have done them before. Rival 2 and Whitney are some big obstacles, so good on Weeping Bell. And as a reward, it's gonna retire. I know, I know, it's sad and it did such good work, but Weeping Bell just simply isn't going to be able to keep up, especially with Abra slash now Kadabra. Unlike in Red and Blue, Evolutionary Stones are not readily available. You cannot get them until after you beat the Elite Four. So, Weeping Bell, while it is one of my favorite Pokemon, it did a good job, but its job is over. Time for Kadabra to take over, and take over does it do. I mean, I'm not even leveling up Kadabra all that much because I'm also focusing on leveling up my Ghastly, but once you get to Ecritique City, it's just a complete joke. Psybeam, 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 nothing comes even close. Even the Gengar, I was concerned because of its speed and special, no way. Kadabra outsped, Kadabra one hit KO. Just absolute dominance. I'm telling you, there's a reason Kadabra is my favorite Pokemon, and I'm gonna be honest, and you might be thinking, why even have the Ghastly? Why not just use Kadabra? You will see, thank goodness I had the Ghastly. I had it for a bit of a different reason than what you're gonna see initially, but trust me, it would not have worked if I just had Kadabra. And the mentality I had in this run was better to train up too many Pokemon and waste a little time than not to train up enough and have to go back and find a new Pokemon, which did happen, as you're gonna see. But for now, it's time to turn Ghastly from something that is not usable whatsoever into something that is kind of usable, and that's gonna require it to evolve into Haunter. So what I did is went to Olivine City, got the good rod, and started fishing for Krabby. Krabby have decent attack, and the truth is, at one point, I was considering using a Staryu for Jasmine. Didn't end up being necessary, but it was one of my considerations. Staryu only appears at 10%, so in the meantime, I was knocking out all the Krabby. At first, it was taking multiple hits, so I'd have to use Hypnosis, but eventually, especially once it became Haunter, it took less and less hits, meaning that Haunter was becoming more and more usable. In addition, as some of you more competitive players know, I'm also EV training my Haunter. I don't have a lot of money to buy vitamins, but this is a great way to get its attack to go up and up. We do need Shadow Ball to be somewhat decent, so this worked out very, very well. Now, like Red and Blue, once you get to the gym that houses the fourth city, in this case, Ecritique, the game opens up significantly. Once you defeat Morty, you can use Surf. So you can go to Olivine, Cyanwood, and Mahogany, and there are trainers all over, such as the Glitter Lighthouse and Lake of Rage. Something else that is available at the Lake of Rage is Hidden Power. Now, Hidden Power is one of the most confusing moves in the entire Pokemon franchise. It's based on your DVs or IVs in modern generations, and prior to Generation 5, it could deal anywhere from, I believe, 30 to 70 base power of damage. And all of this was kept completely hidden from you. It would just appear as a normal move, and base powers weren't even something you could look up until Generation 3. Not that Hidden Power would reveal what it was. So, I tried Hidden Power on a bunch of Pokemon and found something very curious for Haunter. My Haunter had roughly a base 55 to 60 base power, Psychic type Hidden Power. I could not have hand-picked something more useful for Haunter to have. Because A, it takes advantage of Haunter's amazing special, and B, while not as overpowered as Generation 1, Psychic is still extremely powerful in Generation 2 with very few immunities or resistances, and so we're gonna be using Hidden Power a whole lot. And because I have Hidden Power, I actually don't need to rely on Kadabra to fight Chuck, but I can use Haunter, albeit with a little more luck involved. Primeape is a one-hit KO with Hidden Power. Polyrath will be a two-hit KO, so I use Hypnosis. Chuck will always go for a full heal, thus giving me that free turn I need to use the second hidden power and defeating Chuck. Kadabra would have done this easily in one hit, but Kadabra can kind of do everything easily, and I need Haunter to be at a good level, so the more experience points I can get with Haunter, the better. 
plus, it's kind of nice that the last three gyms have been fought with three different Pokemon. Bet you didn't think you'd be seeing that when you clicked on this video, but we are using a variety of Pokemon with still a newcomer yet to follow, which actually isn't coming for a little while, and I keep hyping it up, but do not worry, I will get to it. We still have a few more gyms to go. And Jasmine, the sixth gym, I was kind of concerned about, but that concern ended up being not really all that warranted. Kadabra knows Fire Punch. I equip with the Charcoal. I did need to level up to level 38. I tried at level 37, it wasn't as consistent, but the Magnemites are easy one hit KO with Fire Punch, and so was the Steelix, although it was still a range, so my first attempt did not go well, even at level 38. But what can you do? Ranges are going to exist, and I'm really happy about the fact we're not significantly overleveled, and yet we've been able to pretty easily, all things considered, get through the first six gyms without taking any damage. And the seventh gym isn't going to really provide much of an issue either. And it's kind of weird that the canonical seventh gym has weaker Pokemon than the sixth gym. There's a couple times where Game Freak has sort of allowed you to complete gym leaders in whatever order you want. Generation 4 is another example of this. And it's clear to me that they anticipated you going right, fighting Price first, trying to fight Jasmine, realizing you have to go to Cyanwood, then facing Chuck, his Pokemon are a little stronger, and then going to face Jasmine before taking on Team Rocket. That's my theory, but either way, not much to say about this battle. Thunder Punch, Thunder Punch, Fire Punch. Good job, Kadabra, once again, making it look easy. And this part of the game, which pretty much encompassed after you defeat Morty until we end up defeating the Team Rockets in Radio Tower, is what I like to call the Big Lull. And don't get me wrong, I love Gold and Silver, and I genuinely think Heart Gold and Soul Silver are the best made Pokemon games ever, including the recent ones. But this is still kind of a tedious section because they sort of intended you to do it in any order. The Pokemon are all really under level. So it lacks any sort of challenge or suspense. There is a rival battle that you think would be kind of difficult, but since there are so many trainers and I'm only using two Pokemon, he isn't. None of his Pokemon have priority moves, Feraligator is only at level 32, and Kadabra has such great special attack that a single Thunder Punch is all you need. You use some Fire Punches, some Psychics, not a problem whatsoever. And because none of the trainers here are all that difficult, I mean, of course, if you mess up, or if something uses Quick Attack and you're not using Haunter, it can be problematic, but as long as you don't and you're smart about which Pokemon you're using, you should be fine. So let's skip all the way ahead to Blackthorn City, the final gym. And one of my biggest pet peeves is that the final gym in Johto doesn't even use fully evolved Pokemon. I don't know. I understand that there are more gyms to come, spoiler alert, but it's still weird to me. Claire didn't have at least one underlevel Dragonite. I don't know. That's just my take. Claire definitely was a lot more challenging in that I needed to level up. Of course, the first three Dragonair can all be easily handled by an Ice Punch. Kingdra, however, has really good stats, and even a single Psychic wasn't enough to knock it out. You'd think, why not get the Twisted Spoon? Unfortunately, that is not an item that is available with one cartridge. We are only using one cartridge, and you would need to trade in a Kadabra from Pokemon Yellow. We're not going to be doing that. So my options were to either level up a little bit more, hope for a crit, or see if something else weird happened. We got something else weird. Claire decided to go for Smokescreen, then a Hyper Potion. Thankfully, I don't miss, and I'm able to knock out Kingdra with a second Psychic. At level 49, and what was interesting to me is trying to do this challenge as at low a level as possible, because of course I could just get to level 100 and everything would be easy, mostly. But it's interesting to me to see if I use kind of regularly leveled Pokemon and to not take damage in any of the major battles. It was something I felt very proud, but that feeling would soon be taken away and replaced with just pure frustration. Because after we finish with the two routes and then Victory Road, which is empty and just a miniature version of Red and Blue Victory Road, which I'm fine with, but I kind of wish it wasn't empty. It just feels like a waste of space. But we're about to start battling the Elite Four, and let's take a quick look ahead at what we're going to be dealing with. We have Will, the Psychic-type user. Well, both Kadabra and Haunter have moves that will help me out here, so I wasn't too worried about him. Then we have Koga, 
who I like to call New Bruno. He is just as bad, if not worse. So I'm not really worried about him either. Also, one thing I want to make note of here, which is a bit of a spoiler, is that while Koga and Will both have Pokemon that use Quick Attack, I have never seen either of those Pokemon use it a single time. So I don't think they're programmed to do so, unless you're at very low health and it will knock you out. Then we have actual Bruno. He replaces one of his Onyxes with a Hitmontop. I didn't even realize it also knows Quick Attack. I have never seen it use it a single time. Not too worried about him either. Then we have Karen. And Karen, I was worried about. Because the best Pokemon to use for Karen, thinking back on it, would probably have been Primeape. A Pokemon that is a version exclusive and not available in Silver version, which is the version I was using. I realized that a single Fire Punch from Kadabra wouldn't be anywhere close to knocking out Umbreon, and Umbreon is insanely trolly. Plus, she has Houndoom, and that would have been a problem too. I thought of using Hitmonlee, but the problem with that is Vileplume is a Grass Poison, and while yeah, I'd need to train it up, but Vileplume's defense is decent, I'm not sure if that would work. So I decided to settle on a non-fighting Pokemon, but something that had a bunch of different moves at its disposal in Nidoking. In retrospect, wish I would have used Gold version and just a Primeape, but Nidoking, I would need to catch one and train one up, which took several hours. And honestly, didn't work out nearly as well as I hoped it would. There was a mistake made, but it is what happened. So after countless hours of trying the Elite Four again and again and again, because if you are new to my channel, this is a rule I try never to break, we do not save between Elite Four members. I grew up on Pokemon Stadium 2, and you were not allowed to save between Elite Four members. And I would never consider this challenge to be complete if I didn't abide by that rule. You might think it's arbitrary, but it's the way I've always played, so gosh darn it, we're going to be doing it now. Cue whatever theme music I'm using in this challenge, and let's talk about Will. So Will could easily be defeated with Kadabra, but I want to use Haunter since it does need the experience points for reasons that will become apparent shortly. With Haunter, it's a 90% chance that Will will be okay. The only Pokemon that can pose a problem is Slowbro, which is a range, even at my current level, with a spell tag. However, Slowbro likes to use Amnesia, so it's not a problem. I do want to take an opportunity to talk about a very weird thing in Gold and Silver, and I wonder if someone can lend an explanation other than it just being random, because from my experience, what order the Elite Four member sends out their final three Pokemon is completely random. This actually does become relevant in one of the battles, and it makes it a little bit more annoying to strategize, because I'm not exactly sure which Pokemon is coming out when, so I had to have alternate strategies just in case. In this battle, Slowbro came out fourth. I do not get the Shadow Ball range, but it uses Amnesia, which is just as well. Zatu comes out last, also one hit KO, and there goes Will. And probably the nicest thing I can say about Will is you guys won't get on my case for how I pronounce his name. So that's pretty cool. Then comes Koga, the worst gym leader in Red and Blue, who is the worst Elite Four member. We're going to use Kadabra, and you can pretty much use almost any super effective move you want. Thunder Punch, depending on your level, can be a range against the Crobat, but I didn't do that. I just used Psychic. You don't need the power points, so it's not a big deal. You can just use Psychic four times, and then Fire Punch must be used on Fortress for obvious reasons. Actually, maybe Psychic would want a KO. Who cares? The 5A button strategy worked wonders, and new Bruno is just as bad as old Bruno. Speaking of old Bruno, let's go battle him. And here's something hilarious and very fitting. Bruno was a run ender for me for a very long time. Why? Well, if I can just pause my footage for a second, Bruno's Hitmonchan has Mach Punch. You think it wouldn't use it against a Kadabra because it's not very effective, but you'd be wrong. It is programmed for whatever reason to always use Mach Punch against Kadabra. I don't know if it's because it would one hit KO. I don't know if it's because it outspeeds. Whatever the reason, Bruno will always use Mach Punch. And it affects Kadabra, and I can't outspeed a priority move, so I would lose. Haunter, on the other hand, 
didn't have the power necessary to knock out Bruno's Pokemon. Yes, if we had Psychic, that would be lovely, but that's not available till after we defeat the Elite Four. So here's what I ended up having to do. Hitmontop always comes out first, Psychic won a KO. Onyx always comes out second, Psychic or Ice Punch won a KO. Now it's random and you do not want to see Hitmonchan right here. I got Hitmon Lee so I can keep Kadabra in and use Psychic. Now Hitmonchan can appear here and that would be really bad, but I got Machamp and Psychic is a one KO. When this happens, I have a 100% chance of winning. Hitmonchan always goes for Mac Punch, doesn't affect Taunter, and my Hidden Power Psychic, which I'm very lucky to have, will one hit KO. But what if I didn't have Hidden Power Psychic? What if I didn't get that lucky? Well, what I would have to do is the same strategy as what I do when I don't get Hitmonchan last, which is I swap into Haunter, use Hypnosis, which has a 60% chance to hit. If I miss, the run is over. If I don't, I swap back into Kadabra, hoping it's still asleep, hoping it stays asleep a third turn because it will use Mach Punch, and then sweeping through the rest of the team with Psychic. Alternatively, I could opt to use Shadow Ball twice and potentially have to put both of Hitmonlee and Machamp to sleep if I get the worst possible luck since they both would be a two hit KO. I think the Kadabra strategy is less luck based, so that is what I would have gone with. I had runs where that happened. Thankfully, I got optimal luck this time. It would run out because once I got past Bruno, I realized that my calculations that I'd done for Karen were very, very wrong. I completely miscalculated and Nido King's Earthquake was not doing anywhere close to the amount of damage I hoped it would do. So, I had to rely on an insanely luck-based strategy, but it's all I had. So I'm leading with Haunter and going for Hypnosis. If you miss, it's not the end of the world because it likes to use Sand Attack and there's a 25% chance that fails because Gen 1 and 2 works that way. So that can't happen, didn't hear, I got the sleep. Now I swap into Nidoking and needed to stay asleep for two more turns. Earthquake is so close to one hit KOing but is not quite there. And thankfully Umbreon in this instance stayed asleep. So far so good, but here comes the second luck based element, Vileplume. I could have leveled up more, but Vileplume is a 70% chance at my current level to one hit KO. And of course I missed the range, it goes for Stun Spore and thank goodness it misses. All things being equal, that's a 25% chance, although I think with the weird way Gen 1 and 2 work, it's more like 44% chance. I'll take it, and now I win. All I need to do is use Ice Punch on the Murkrow, 1 hit KO, and then Earthquake on the Houndoom and the Gengar. Thankfully, I outspeed because I didn't use Rare Candies, I didn't use the Daycare, I actually spent two hours training this Nidoking up so it would have decent static speed, and buying some vitamins because I had some money now. And while it did require some luck and leveling up, I was able to make it through the first four Elite Four members, and then I'd face Lance. Lance wasn't the champion before. He's been promoted now. And because Lance is the best, we're going to have to use the best in Kadabra. He leads with Gyarados, which is four times weak to Thunder Punch, and there are three Dragonite, who are all four times weak to Ice Punch. The issues are Aerodactyl and Charizard. Aerodactyl was always a one hit KO and thankfully I outsped, but Charizard, I missed the range five consecutive times until I realized, hey, you know there's an item called the Magnet, which you can use and you can equip it and then you won't miss the range. And once I realized that, I felt really silly. But with the Magnet equipped, I knocked out the Charizard, followed by the Dragonite, and I am officially champion of Johto. But, and this is just my opinion, the one thing about Gold and Silver which I find makes them less exciting as videos is that the difficulty of the game then decreases dramatically before having a monumental increase in the final battle. I don't mind this playing casually, but in terms of a narrative, the Kanto Gym Leaders aren't all that interesting. In fact, in the eight gym battles, there are only a handful of Pokemon that are not one-hit KOs. But there is one big thing we're going to be doing, which is we're going to only be using Haunter the rest of the way. The reason for this I'll go over shortly, but we can pick up Psychic from Mr. Psychic as soon as we get to Kanto, and that's a massive boost to Haunter. But since we're in Saffron, for my first Kanto gym leader, I challenge Sabrina. 
While she's super difficult in red and blue, she only has three Pokemon in Espeon, Mr. Mime, and Alakazam, I outspeed, and Shadow Ball is a one-hit KO. Next, I decided to battle Erika, although I could have waited. Erika's Blossom is one of the two Pokemon that is not a one-hit KO. Doesn't matter if you use Shadow Ball or Psychic, she's also added a Jump Bluff to her team. So use Psychic against the Tangela and the Victory Bell. I tried to put Blossom to sleep, I missed, but it used Sunny Day, second Hypnosis hit, and then two Shadow Balls are all I need to knock out Blossom. Jump Bluff was a one-hit KO with Psychic, and that's Gym Badge number two of Kanto. Number three is Janine. She has five Pokemon, but they're at extremely low levels. I'm not really sure why you'd even have a level 36 Crobat this late into the game. Her most powerful Pokemon isn't even level 40, it's a level 39 Venomoth. I used Shadow Ball on her first three Pokemon, and for the two Weezing, I used Psychic because I didn't even bother restoring power points. And that's badge number 11 for J-Rose 11. I then decided to go back to Vermilion to fight Lieutenant Surge. Raichu has Quick Attack, which it almost always uses, I found, when I used any other Pokemon. But with Haunter, we don't have to worry. Psychic knocks out the Raichu, Electrode, and Electabuzz without issue. The Magneton was just barely a two-hit KO, but decided to use Double Team, and I didn't miss with Psychic. I could have just come back after I battled some of the other gyms, but I'm not going to complain. Now, in order to progress further, there is some plot stuff you need to do, involving getting a machine part and waking up the Snorlax to go through Diglett Cave. And there's a whole lot of trainers, so you can see my levels rising. Misty would otherwise be a little difficult. Her Golduck and Quagsire were easy one-hit KOs with Psychic, but Lapras wasn't. Now, this wasn't really an issue because I had the TM for Giga Drain, and you can get the TM for Thunder from the Goldenrod Game Corner, both of which would be one-hit KOs, but it used Rain Dance, so I didn't have to. Starmie is Psychic type, so Shadow Ball was an easy one-hit KO against it. Levels are finally rising, but we're still not even seeing Pokemon at level 50, which is what Lance's Pokemon used. That trend will continue for Brock, who, although has five Pokemon, the highest leveled one is Onix, which is terrible in the late game. Psychic easily one-hit KOs every Pokemon. Again, Giga Drain would have been fine as well, but I didn't even need to teach it yet. If you're wondering why I'm saving it, I'm not sure if I'm going to need all or any of Hypnosis, Giga Drain, or Thunder later on. So the later I have to make that decision, the better it will be. The last thing you want to do is to teach a move like Earthquake to Nidoking and realize, hey, maybe I could have gotten a Heracross or something and that would have been better. So teaching TMs as late as you possibly can is always a good strategy. Anyways, I go to Seafoam Islands to battle Blaine. He only has three Pokemon, finally level 50 though, a Micargo, a Magmar, and a Rapidash. No idea what happened to our canine. They all faint with a single Psychic, no issues. But now we finally battle someone who does pose a challenge, Blue. Or, as he's more properly known, Rival Fival. Yeah, I, I realized I didn't talk about the fourth rival fight as you exit Victory Road, but it was really easy. And I know this guy isn't your rival, but technically, it is the fifth battle against a rival-like character, so I'm gonna count it. Anyway, let's talk about my first attempt against him. Pidgeot, I do get a critical hit, but normally would require two hits. Gyarados would require two hits, but I get Rain Dance. Finally, in this first attempt, our Canine also requires two hits. I didn't realize, and it attacks me, ending this battle. Now that was extremely lucky and I still lost, albeit had I used Hypnosis I probably would have won, but I'd like to cut out some of that luck. So what I'm going to do is teach Thunder. I'd like to teach Thunderbolt but it's not a TM in Generation 2 and the move tutor that teaches Thunder is only in Crystal version. Thankfully from battling every trainer I can and using the amulet coin I have more than enough coins to buy several thunders if I would have wanted them, which I didn't realize. And I go back to face blue. With thunder in hand, there is a bit of luck because it's only 70% accuracy. Thankfully, in only my first try, I managed to hit the Pidgeot with that 70%, use Psychic on the Rhydon, use Shadow Ball on the Alakazam, again hit the 70% on the Gyarados, and then followed up with the 60% chance to hit Hypnosis on our Canine, Blue uses a full restore, but because AI items function normally in Gen 2, meaning they always happen at the beginning of the turn, the full restore happens before I attack, 
as opposed to generation one where it would happen after so i'm able to use my second attack knock out the arcanine all that's left is executor i use shadow ball and down goes blue now the chance of everything happening like they did in that battle not super high roughly 30 percent which isn't amazing but it's also not terrible it's also important to note our canine knows extreme speed another increased priority move so using haunter is essential again i love kadabra but we need that immunity to priority moves and all we have left is one final battle against red this is the battle i was dreading the most red's team is one of the most powerful teams in the entire Pokemon series, not counting rematches or anything like that. Just the standard battle is insane. His lowest level Pokemon is a level 73 Espeon, a level 75 Snorlax, three level 77 Pokemon, Charizard, Blastoise, and Venusaur, and a level 81 Pikachu, which is 88 in the remakes, by the way. So yeah, this is going to be very, very difficult. Now something hilarious, which I should admit, is the original reason I wanted to use Haunter was for this battle. Pikachu knows Quick Attack, and Snorlax has incredibly good special. I knew Kadabra, even at level 100, would have a hard time knocking it out in one hit. That being said, it doesn't know any moves that can affect Haunter, so I was pretty sure Haunter was the right call. That didn't mean the battles went well. Pikachu wasn't a problem, but when the Snorlax appeared, I wasn't really able to do anything to it. It would go for Amnesia right away, and its special would be so high, I would run out of Psychics and Thunders before I came anywhere close to knocking it out, because every two turns it could gain all its HP back by using Rest. So what was I going to do? Well, funny enough, I was looking at the final battle to narrate it, and realized that part of the footage corrupted, which is both good and bad. It's good because it's very easy to redo the final battle and you don't miss anything. It's bad because I don't get to show you all my failed attempts, at least beyond the ones you're seeing already. But eventually I did come up with a strategy and while it required a bit of luck, because unlike the Elite Four, I can just save and reset again and again, it's simply a matter of coming up with the right strategy and then persevering. Although the battle I'm about to show you is substantially less lucky than the one I originally got. The one kind of annoying thing is that you do need to beat the Elite Four before Red reappears. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, which will raise Haunter's level above what it was when I initially won, but it's all good. And now, without further ado, let's talk about the final battle versus Red. Pikachu is pretty much not an issue. I outspeed, one hit KO with Shadow Ball. Now for Snorlax, I finally figured out a way to knock it out, and this battle actually was a little bit luckier than some of my others, but it involves using Swagger. Swagger both raises attack and confuses the Pokemon, and because Snorlax doesn't attack me, I usually can get past the Snorlax. The question is, how many power points will I have? Essentially, what I'd like to happen is use Swagger the first turn and have Snorlax hit in confusion before it uses Amnesia. That didn't happen, it actually used two amnesias which means my psychics are going to do next to nothing that's not ideal in many other unsuccessful battles what would happen is it would hit itself in confusion i used psychic it hit itself in confusion again i'd use psychic and down went snorlax this time snorlax went to sleep i had to use a bunch of psychics and only because i got two consecutive critical hits which is incredibly unlikely and then it hit itself in confusion that i was able to knock it out not really the strategy I had in mind, but whatever. The next Pokemon is Espeon, Shadow Ball knocks it out, then comes out Venusaur. If I had a Twisted Spoon or was like 5 levels higher, it would be a 1 hit KO, but it isn't right now. And 75% of the time, it will go for Sunny Day and then follow up with Solar Beam, which gives me 2 turns to knock it out with Psychic. That's good, right? Wrong, because when Sunny Day is used, Thunder's accuracy drops to 50% meaning the chance I hit two consecutive thunders to win this battle would be a mere 25%. Of course, in this battle, 
Venusaur decided to go for Solar Beam, which is the first time I've literally ever seen that. And I've done like 20 to 30 attempts, so I'm not going to complain. And because of that, I now have a 49% chance, so double the odds of winning this battle. And thankfully, I capitalize on those odds, knocking out the Charizard and the Blastoise with a single Thunder. Again, Thunderbolt would have completely solved this problem, although I may have needed to level up more for it to be a one-hit KO. But we have done it once again. In the first battle, Venusaur did use Sunny Day, and I still hit two consecutive Thunders, which definitely was pretty lucky. This battle wasn't luck-free by any means, but we were able to beat all of Johto without taking damage, only leveling up to level 80. Actually, originally it was level 78, but whatever. This is the one I have proof of, so we're going to go with level 80. And that's it for this video. I am surprised how well this went, and I'm happy that I was able to use so many different Pokemon and different strategies. The run wasn't perfect. Using Gold version for Primeape or potentially using Heracross may be better strategies in the future. That said, I don't really plan on doing this in Crystal or something. It's just too similar, and I have so many other challenges I want to do. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, please subscribe. I have some pretty crazy challenges coming up that are maybe even more insane than this one. Who's to say, really? But once again, thank you so much for watching my content. The channel's been doing so well lately. I'm glad I get so many positive comments that you guys are enjoying. I really appreciate reading all of them. And I'll see you all in three, four days. Who knows? Take care, guys. Bye.